When I was working at Monsanto, I was very worried that the time that I was spending was going to feel like a lot was being done, but that it wasn't actually getting anything done. So when I was traveling around meeting with those 50 people on the first list and then the 50 people on the next, I was getting to talk with geneticists and statisticians and chemists. And so I was able to ask them questions like, how do you think ideas spread into society? How does an idea go from a small group of people out to being what everybody knows is true, right? How does everyone know that Monsanto is evil? And so over time, we began to develop what I call the well actually graph, which is a depiction of how ideas spread into society. So we're going to do this. We'll walk through it. It's two axes. On this axis, there's value. All ideas have some discrete amount of value, right? And then you can put that against the number of people that know that idea, right? And so imagine if you were Monsanto, for example, and you're hacking away through the genome of corn, and ping, you discover something totally new and novel that no one has ever seen before. The value of knowing that idea about how roots grow or about a new genetically engineered solution is really high. But the number of people that know it's really low. It's just a cluster of scientists, maybe one company. But now let's zoom the camera lens back and let's say we're not just talking about genetic engineering or Monsanto, we're talking about any piece of information, like a stock tip, for example. As more and more people begin to hear and activate on a stock tip, the value of that idea goes down as it spreads out against more and more people. You can't get as much work out of that, out of that discrete piece of information. And so I always talk about uh, down here, right? This is when I get a phone call from my mother, right? And she says, Vance, Vance, I was watching CNN or MSNBC or Fox or whatever she's listening to, and I heard this thing about farming or about energy. To my mother, CNN, Fox, MSNBC, this is the cutting edge. This is where news happens. But everybody in this room knows those are large, slow, lumbering organizations. By the time they get to an idea, it has already come from way up the graph. And one time I was giving this presentation, and this old grain trader was, was listening to me intently, and he stands up, and he takes the, I was drawing it on a whiteboard, and he takes the marker out of my hand and he says, you know what Vance, you're exactly right. That is how information spreads. And Monsanto, we respond to things out here. <laughs> how many of you is that true for? Right? You wait until the information is way out there to respond. And that means that you are competing with everyone else that wants to get my mother and everybody else's attention all the way down the graph, which means it is really expensive because if everybody is, is trying to get their news and ideas all the way down to the bottom of the graph, it increases the cost, how creative you have to be, how much money you have to spend to get that attention. So we decided that what we were going to do was we were going to try and move back up this graph as high as we could go. So we started doing things like writing for the Huffington Post, or getting, letting Vice News in, right? Or doing articles on LinkedIn. One of the things that you realize is that as you go up this graph, the audiences get smaller and smaller. But the depth with which people want to know things gets deeper and deeper and deeper. Which is why I mark this point right here. This is the point where and all of you have experienced this, and I suspect, because you're communicators, you might be this person. You know when you're at a party and everybody's standing around talking about whatever's going on in the news, and they're just kind of, people are just sharing what they know, and there's always that one person that waits for a pause in the conversation, and then they go, well, actually. <laughs> and then they jump in and tell you whatever it is that they know. And they say this because they've watched one documentary, Food Inc. or Cowspiracy or something about on Netflix with the energy, and they know just a little bit more than the other people in that conversation. So what they assert is the thing that becomes what everybody knows, and it further throws that idea out into society. So what we decided, my, my team, that was not trying to do mass publicity, we weren't trying to run ads, that was another team. My team was focused on, let's get up the graph as high as we can to what we call the tribes, right? The tribes are a group of people, and they are in every single domain that you can possibly imagine. 
they are the ones that cluster together around certain types of information. It could be that they love a sports team. It could be that they go to certain churches. It could be that they work out at CrossFit or in a certain way. Maybe they do jujitsu, right? But they cluster together and they have the same news outlets and the same valuation of how does the world work that they start thinking in somewhat of a similar way. And so the way that I often describe this is imagine that you're out in the world. This is, so there's a guy named Yosha Bach and he was an artificial intelligence researcher out of MIT. And he decided that what he was gonna do, if he's gonna study artificial intelligence, what he wants to do is say, how do we get computers to think like human beings? Well, if you want computers to think like human beings, you first have to know how do human beings think. So he went out and did 10 years of research and he stood up at this conference. I found it on YouTube during one of my explorations. And he's standing up at this conference and he says, after 10 years of research, I have discovered that human beings know almost nothing at all. Which that becomes a paradox, right? How, how is it possible that we have lights and Wi-Fi and fly on planes? How can you possibly say that human beings don't know very much at all? And he said, well, human beings are not designed to know very much at all. We're designed to know one or two things very deeply, and everything else we rely on our tribe to help us understand. Because we don't have time to understand everything else, so we just rely on those groups of people that we share news and information with. So imagine that you're out in the world. And imagine that you hear, hey, did you know chemicals are being used to grow our food? No, I didn't, I didn't know that. I, I don't have any way to feel about that, good or bad. So I'm going to turn to my tribe and I'm going to say, hey, guys, did you know, whether it's my CrossFit gym or my school or my uh, church, did you guys know that chemicals are being used to grow our food? Well, whatever answer they give back to me, I don't have some deep knowledge of it. So if they say, that's poison, that will kill us all, Okay, people that think like me, people that are in my tribe, we think this way. So they go to put it out into social media, right? And what happens if somebody that knows more about that subject, somebody in agriculture walks past that and says, wait a second, chemicals aren't poison that'll kill us all, and they start shooting at that idea. How does this person perceive that? Not as you're shooting at their idea, but that you're shooting at their tribe. And so they entrench which we've all seen this on social media, right? They get really, really upset and angry and say you know, crazy things even though you know more about the subject than they do. So what we decided was we are going to focus on those tribes. How can you get in there not to change one individual that's gonna fight to the death to be a part of their own tribe, but how can you choose clusters of people that have a reason to change their way of thinking? And I wanna give you an example of this and how it works, in particular, how it works in a domain that a lot of you are familiar with. I'm, a lot of my examples are agriculture. I know there are energy people in here, but you bear with me because this is the tribe I know. I'm more than happy when we're done to have somebody show me these are the tribes in energy. I would love to know that. But it, do any of you recognize this man here? This man is an exceptional person. He is a cattle rancher in Oklahoma, and his name is Jared McDaniel. He's standing next to his beautiful wife. They have six children together. He runs a podcast called Ag Uncensored. This is a you know, small podcast. He has a little building in his downtown area. He set up a podcasting studio, and he started saying, I'm going to do interviews with those people that have the unorthodox opinions the ones that get you in trouble if you say them at the coffee shop, the ones that you don't always hear about. And he started having these interviews with people and just publishing it online, and before you knew it, he had popped all the way up to the top of the graph. He now is where new opinions pop out of the ground and start getting shared out in the wider world. And you guys should see, if you've not listened to this podcast, he is getting better and better and better. Right now, what's going on in the cattle industry is that producers and meat packers are fighting over how much should the price of beef be. And that fight's getting real, right? It was in front of Congress yesterday. Well, somebody from the NCBA, the National Cattle Association, is coming on his podcast next week. And it will be a better interview than we hear on any traditional news outlet. So by knowing that there are people out there that are like Jared, that are the tip of the, of the graph, 
then you can find where should I be putting my people? Where should I be getting my information to? Who should we be willing to have conversations with that will get us all the way up this graph? Because the conversation he's going to have with the NCBA, that's going to rocket down that graph and be shared with potentially millions of people and actually have an impact on how does that spread out into the world. You need to find creators like Jared. In fact, you should follow Jared. You should tell him, hey, I'm at this conference. I heard about it. I'm looking forward to seeing this talk. And then he will know that you're out there and he, if, you have, if he ever has a question where your leader is the one that would be a great person to talk with to get a new idea out there, then you're the first person that comes to mind. So by focusing your attention on social media, on podcasts that are up the graph, you start getting way more leverage out of your energy. Does anyone know this person? She's pretty obscure, but there might be some people in this room that know who this is. This is a woman named Hannah Morgan Miller. Hannah Mo Miller on Twitter. She, uh, I, I would share her Facebook, but I always feel like Facebook is a neighborhood thing, right? It's like, you know, telling people, hey, come to my town. She is really prolific on Facebook. She is not an opinion creator. She is a connector. She creates various groups, little tribes that get together and share information in those Facebook groups and says, hey, I'm working on this problem. Does anybody have an answer for it? Hey, I, I'm struggling with this idea. Hey, I have a customer I can't service. Can anybody else do it? She is one of the people that is always in a tribe. They're not the loud, flashy person. They're not the person that goes out and gets everybody to pay attention or jokes around on Twitter. They're the person that collects all the dots and then connects all the dots. And by being that person, they create communities that make that tribe form together. I have a sense that there might be quite a few of you in this room that are connectors. You don't necessarily want the spotlight, but you're really happy to connect different people together so that they can get ideas out there. If you can find the connectors within a tribe, you can connect with them and they'll get your ideas out. And if you can't find it, then you can become it for your own tribe, however you define that tribe. And then finally, does anybody know this character? I'm referring to the man on the left as opposed to the little girl. Anybody here? This is a man named Dwayne Faber, or D. Faber 84. Anybody know him now? I see some smiles, that's right. Why? Why do you know who he is? Because he's hilarious, right? He's a comedian. Comedians are in every single tribe. Now you may know people that are a comedian for a tribe and not know it because all humor is tribal. And here's the reason for it. I, th I think Dwayne Faber is one of the most fascinating people in all of social media. Regardless of agriculture, he is fascinating. Because what a comedian can do is they can say, hey, I know there's an idea here and an idea over here. And if I can connect these two ideas, the further apart that they are, if I can connect them in your minds by making a joke, then you'll laugh, and then you'll see the world the way that I see the world. So comedians have the power of being further down that graph because they can get into other tribes and share an idea so that it's so funny it spreads out and gets into another group of people. And you can watch Dwayne be able to work out ideas about agriculture that then spread into wider society in a way that no serious document's ever going to do. No infographic, nothing. So if any of you have a good sense of humor and you're not using it on social media, you may be missing the opportunity to be connecting with other tribes. And if you're not the type of person that has a great sense of humor, my brother makes fun of my sense of humor all the time, but I'm not trying to be that. But I can find people that are humorous, that have these good ideas, and propagate their ideas out into the world as well. Finding the comedians within a tribe is deeply important because I don't know who it is for energy, but I will guarantee you there are people that are making jokes about energy production and distribution. You just have to go out and find them. So also be thinking of them because I want to write them down after we're done. And the further that you can get that down the graph, now, if he sees a podcast that Jared McDaniel put out, and he makes a joke that can spread it out into the wider world, now you're watching ideas go all the way from the top of the graph, way out into society.